Greetings. Thank you for joining us. My name is Arzu Osanlu. My colleagues and I are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to the second installment of our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. The speakers in our series consider the discursive processes through which entire regions of the world have been written out of the narrative of the origins of an impulse to humanitarian care. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead experiences across the global south with a particular focus on South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Regions which have been conceptually marked off from understandings of humanitarianism, but which have hosted the bulk of the world's refugees since World War II. Across three thematic clusters, decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism, comparative humanitarianism, and rethinking the human, we compare important conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices. These comparisons will allow us to illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment constitute the objects of suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. And now I turn over to my colleague, Kabiri Robinson, for a few additional remarks. So our fall theme is decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism. This part of the Sawyer seminar focuses on the history of forced migrations within and across the global south. Through this focus on the global south, we aim to examine humanitarian practices that emerge in relation to, but not necessarily from, a Euro-American genealogy set within the politics of international asylum and refugee laws that first grew out of World War II. We believe that the work of decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism requires two key intellectual moves. The first is to reorient our perspectives towards the primary spaces of care by focusing on forced migrants in the global south, the primary site for hosting, and on those host countries and communities experiences and practices of hosting. The second is to move away from a primarily Euro-American intellectual history in order to consider the ideological underpinnings of caring for distant others outside of these enlightenment frames. We envision that the comparative reorientation such as these will transform our perspectives on humanitarian care to integrate diverse rationalities and the forms of expertise that underlie them. Thus, it is with great pleasure that we welcome Ilana Feldman and pa Pamela Ballinger to this series of public presentations and discussions in the Humanitarianism series. Today's speaker challenged conventional genealogies of humanitarianism by asking us to consider the emergence of a concept of humanitarian rights among refugees who demand recognition as rights bearing subjects, and to rethink our understanding of the foundations of the international refugee regime by examining the multiple exclusions from refugee recognitions, even of those displaced within Europe by decolonizing and renationalizing processes. Christian Capotescu, um, the postdoctoral fellow for the Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms will be the moderator of uh, the question and answer portion of this seminar. And I now turn to him to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Kabiri. And I'm delighted to introduce today our two distinguished speakers, Pamela Ballinger, Professor of History 
and Human Rights at the University of Michigan, and Ilana Feldman, Professor of Anthropology, History, and International Affairs at George Washington University. Both speakers have made substantial contributions to the scholarship on humanitarianism, refugees, and migration. Professor Feldman has written extensively about the Palestinian question in Gaza, humanitarian government, and policing, surveillance, and refugee politics in the 20th century. She has published numerous articles and several books on these topics. Her most recent monograph, titled Life Lived in Relief, Humanitarian Predicaments and Palestin Palestinian Refugee Politics, was published with the University of California Press in 2018. Similarly, Professor Ballinger has dedicated large parts of her academic career as an anthropologist and historian to the study of human rights, decolonization, displacement, and the Italian refugee question after World War II, among other topics. She's the author of numerous articles, and her newest book titled The World Refugees Made, Decolonization, and the Foundation of Postwar Italy appeared with Cornell University Press this year. Today's conversation will start with short presentations that Pamela Bellinger and Ilana Feldman have pre-recorded for us and will be followed by a brief conversation between the two speakers led by our discussant Burcu Goz de Ege, who is a doctoral fellow with the Sawyer Seminar. We will then launch into a virtual Q&A. And now, without further ado, we're thrilled to bring to you Ilana Feldman and Pamela Bellinger. So I begin with a petition. In 1981, a Mukhtar, village leader in the Balata refugee camp near Nablus in the West Bank, sent a petition to the High Commissioner of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA, complaining about a significant curtailment in UN rations to Palestinian refugees. And the demand for rations restoration was explicitly couched in the language of rights. I'll read from the petition. The Palestinian refugees who are suffering under occupation appeal to you to extend to them immediate assistance as an act to safeguard their rights and their dignity, which is diminishing day by day and one month after one month. Where is humanity and what they call human rights? The rights that were granted to them by the United Nations in lieu of their usurped lands. Where is justice? Where is democracy? Where is the human rights that protect all the refugees, women, children, and widows who are left without rations and on the verge of extinction? And even as he asked for rations, the Mukhtar distinguished his request from charity. We are not seeking charity or almsgiving. We are after our many usurped rights, the rights which were recognized unanimously by the United Nations. So this petition mobilized the language of human rights in pressing a self-defined humanitarian organization, UNRWA, for a widely recognized humanitarian good. It demanded action in the present to both redress a past wrong and secure future rights. And this kind of multiplicity is common in Palestinian discourse. In the 70 years since, since the displacement and dispossession of the majority of the Palestinian population, they have made rights claims of at least three sorts humanitarian rights, human rights, and national rights. And they've made these claims in multiple fora and to multiple parties. And they have generally presented them as at most different registers of a single rights universe. And I'm gonna to focus today primarily on humanitarian rights, but it should be remembered that such claiming is always part of this multiple field. So first, I want to say a little bit about the landscape that shapes this universe of rights claims. So 750,000 Palestinians were displaced in 1948. There was another wave of displacement in 1967, and there are now around 58 refugee camps across the Middle East. Not all refugees live in camps. Even in the years after 1948, when the highest number did, it was only about half. Now it is a smaller percentage. But camps have always been an important setting for shaping Palestinian refugee politics and claim making. And I should note that I am focusing on refugees, but not all Palestinians are refugees. Here too, 
refugees have been demographically and politically central in a broader Palestinian political landscape and rights universe. So think about refugees as political actors and rights bearing subjects. It is notable in the Palestinian case and not only in the Palestinian case, a non-political humanitarian category becomes a site of politics. Refugee politics challenges existing frameworks for political contestation. And specifically, it expands the grounds on which people make claims within a political space and opens up the categories of people who can claim to have standing for making such claims. So where the classic category for standing in the nation state is the citizen, Refugee politics invites others in. And the aim of refugee politics is not only that refugees be recognized as political actors, but also that the category be understood as world forming in itself. And in this world forming, claiming rights has been a key part of Palestinian refugee politics, but it's never been the whole of this politics. Palestinians have engaged in protest, in, peti in petition, in assembly, in the kind of, you know, sort of everyday politics of encroachment that involves making changes without asking for permission or even asking for recognition. This picture is uh, from the American Friends Service Committee archives. The AFSC provided aid in Gaza before the establishment of UNRWA, and its caption in the archives is dealing with a riot. Uh, this doesn't look very much to me like a riot, but I think it's a clear instance of refugees making claims of humanitarian actors. So what are humanitarian rights? The content, limit, and viability of human rights and national rights are all contested, but their existence is widely acknowledged. Humanitarian rights, on the other hand, seem to many to be an oxymoron. For some critics, the problem with humanitarianism is precisely that it relies on compassion rather than on the more stable ground of rights. But the language of rights is not totally alien to humanitarianism, nor is it new. The concept was articulated in the aftermath of World War I, and both the international obligation to respond to circumstances of suffering and the expectation on the part of victims that such a response should be forthcoming were part of this conceptual framework. The Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees notes that the cornerstone document for refugee protection, the 1951 Refugee Convention, is both a status and rights-based instrument. The principle of non refoulement the right not to be returned to danger, is at the heart of the refugee protection regime. And the convention also specifies other rights, including non-discrimination, access to courts, and the unity that the unity of the family is an essential right of refugees. The protection of civilians in armed conflict is a matter of concern for both international humanitarian law, IHL, and international human rights law. But if human rights are not enough, as Samuel Moyne puts it, humanitarian rights are arguably even less adequate. Jacques Ranciere describes humanitarian rights as the rights of those who cannot enact them, the victims of the absolute denial of rights. And he views these rights as charity, sent abroad along with medicine and clothes to people deprived of medicine, clothes, and rights. But in addition to their articulation in legal domains, protection regimes, and discourses of distant concern, humanitarian rights are also claimed by people such as Palestinians who insist both that humanitarianism is a right and that humanitarianism entails specific obligations. Their demands may not have the force of law, but at least sometimes they have been effective in changing practice. The actions refugees take include, as I said, protests and petitions for better services and more opportunity, and also making changes to shelters and camps without waiting for assistance or permission and they make a range of rights claims. So they insist on their right to humanitarianism. They specifically argue that aid is not charity, but the obligation of the international community. UNRWA, the agency which provides assistance to Palestinian refugees is distinct from the UNHCR, which provides aid and protection 
to most other refugees. The definition of a Palestine refugee focuses on service provision, not on protection. So initially, protection, some of the things that I was talking about as part of the general universe of humanitarian rights, was not built into the UNRWA mandate, but refugees have demanded it. And over the years, UNRWA has taken up protection as part of its mandate, in some sense in, in partial response to refugee insistence. So in addition to a right to humanitarianism, refugees also insist on humanitarian rights. And of course, what's, what such rights are and can be is unsettled. Not only do refugee Palestinians want to have the right to protection uh, that other refugees have, they've also pushed to expand the notion of what might constitute humanitarian rights and regularly insist that such rights are broader than IHL or humanitarian actors might acknowledge or might even be able to acknowledge. For one thing, they clearly uh, claim a right to political life where humanitarian discourse might only be able to acknowledge a right to what is often described as bare life. And they work regularly to link international affirmations of Palestinian rights, such as the right of refugee return to the obligations of international humanitarian actors. Palestinians reference international legal instruments and conventions in making claims to humanitarian rights. And in making UNRWA the addressee for these and other claims is another way in which these rights are articulated as humanitarian rights. They are identified as part of humanitarian responsibility. So for example, um, in the early 1970s, after the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip, uh, an occupation that was met from the outset with, with resistance by Palestinians, the Israeli military, as part of its security measures and a territorially expansionist policy, Israel encouraged immigration from the Strip and forcibly moved refugees out of camps. Refugees protested um, against these forced removals, and they use the language of humanitarian rights to press their claims. Demonstrations targeted UNRWA in an effort to enlist the agency's help. So for example, on July 24th, 1971, a group of demonstrators, mainly women and children, gathered at the gates of UNRWA headquarters early in the morning. And according to a report by the responsible official on site, they came from the direction of Jabalia camp crying, shouting, and demonstrating. The protesters pushed their way on the, into the compound and could not be persuaded to quiet down. A small group of protesters was ultimately brought inside to meet the director. And in the meantime, those outside obstructed staff members from entering their offices. When the meeting concluded, the representatives told the rest of the protesters that they were sure and confident that the director of UNRWA operations is taking the matter seriously, and he has promised to make all their efforts to help them. And at this point, the demonstrators agree to return to the camp. Along with this kind of assembly in the defense of the right not to be further displaced, there were petitions. The president of the UNRWA Staff Association wrote to the Commissioner General in the latter's capacity as the representative of the Secretary General in the United Nations, the guardian of human rights, to put an end to their pains and suffering. He cited legal and political bases for objection to the Israeli demolition plan. Compulsory movement individually and collectively of the inhabitants of the occupied territories is prohibited in accordance with Article 49 of the Geneva Convention. It is prohibited for the occupying state to destroy movable or immovable belongings of individuals or groups of persons, as stated in Article 53 of the above mentioned convention. And as demolitions and evictions continued, UNRWA registered its dissent, but largely in vain. So the fact that UNRWA and refugee protest was to little avail reminds us of the limits of politics in the humanitarian space. And this limit is not simply attributable to the relative weakness of refugees. Rights to humanitarianism and humanitarian rights came together in UNRWA's later acknowledgement of its obligation to provide shelter assistance for persons whose homes were destroyed, making no distinction between destruction by military action, by punitive demolition, or for such reasons as the security road widening operation in the Gaza Strip in 1971. 
So just as Hannah Arendt noted that the right to have rights is more fundamental than any of the specific rights of citizens, so too do Palestinians claim a general right to humanitarian rights that underlies any of the specific rights they demand as refugees. This right to humanitarian rights entails recognition, however limited, of Palestinian inclusion in an international community. To have humanitarian rights does not mean that Palestinians are not refugees, but the claim to these rights does constitute an argument that as refugees, they should not live in the condition of arbitrariness that aren't viewed as the lot of the stateless. What they do, did, or may do should matter, Palestinians argue. And in so claiming, they try to redefine the condition of being a refugee. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Sawyer Seminar for their very kind invitation to speak with you today. In 1946 and 1947, British military officials carried out a series of arrests and deportations of individuals who had moved across borders without permission. Displaced by the events of the Second World War and its end, many of these individuals considered themselves refugees, were labeled as such by their home state, and were young, mere adolescents. So far, nothing in this story sounds remarkable for scholars of Europe's post-war refugee problem. Without further details, we might assume that these apprehended migrants represented one of the many flows of displaced persons into the British zone in Germany after 1945, which led Allied officials to debate the status of post-hostility displacees, including those deemed infiltrees. Or we might guess that these intercepted migrants were Jews bound for Palestine, possibly deported by the British to Cyprus. In this instance, however, the clandestine migrants were Italians, trying to make their way back to Tripolitania, one of the three provinces that had comprised the Italian colony of Libya, and where the Allied and Axis militaries had advanced and retreated throughout 1942 and 1943, but which had definitively come under the control of a temporary British military administration, or BMA, by the end of 1943. Wartime evacuations of women and children from Italy's colonial possessions in Africa and the Balkans had divided families in what was known as Overseas Italy. At its maximum extension in 1940, Italy's overseas empire included colonies, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, departments, Libya and the Dodecanese Islands, and protectorates, Albania. Owing to a series of rapid military defeats, Italy lost de facto control over all of these possessions by 1943, though formal decolonization would stretch into the 1950s and conclude only in 1960. During the war years, Sicily had become temporary home to a number of Italians displaced from Libya, with many of them receiving assistance from Italian authority, authorities in the food, form of food, uh, rations, and housing. Another population of Italians from Libya, some 13,000 young children aged 5 to 14 and sent by ship from the colony to the Italian peninsula on the eve of Italy's, Italy's entry into the war, were scattered across Italy. Like millions of individuals around the world, as the war ended, these Italians displaced from Libya were on the move. The British, who temporarily governed Italy's African territories, neither desired nor encouraged the return of Italians to such areas fearing this could bolster Italian claims at the peace treaty conference and antagonize local populations. Frustrated by the BMA's policies of return, Italians with roots in Libya began to take advantage of the porous sea border and proximity to Italy to make their way across the Mediterranean. The Sicilian city of Siracusa became a well-known departure point from which small boat operators smuggled Italians back into Tripolitania. A prominent BMA administrator claimed, quote, nearly all of the boats came from Syracuse, leaving that port in daylight with up to 250 persons aboard each craft. The boats reached the Tripolitanian coast under the cover of darkness, unloaded their passengers, and endeavored to be away again and out of sight of land before daybreak. No two landings were made at the same place. The arrivals had all formerly lived in Tripolitania, and most were women and children seeking to rejoin their family breadwinners. End quote. In April 1947 alone, the BMA deported 140 migrants back to Italy on the ship Endeavour and another 30 on the Toscana, 
At that same moment, however, other Italians desperately sought to migrate out of the former territories and to Italy, often encountering reluctance from an Italian state anxious to modulate flows of impoverished settlers back into a metropole that had been devastated by warfare and was dotted with camps housing foreign displaced persons, notably Yugoslavs, and individuals who had already fled Italy's lost territories. The restrictions on movement prompted various kinds of petitions and appeals by those individuals who over time came to be designated as Italian national refugees, in contrast to international or bona fide refugees eligible for assistance from relevant UN agencies. Individual Italians sent appeals to the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, or UNRWA, and the International Refugee Organization, or IRO, requesting varied forms of assistance. Some sought return to Libya and other Italian colonies, others desired help to migrate to Italy, and others requested recognition as bona fide refugees seeking assistance to emigrate abroad. In my book, The World Refugees Made, I examine and unpack the categorical ambiguity of these former Italian settlers petitioning for their rights as refugees. This is a population that doesn't fit conventional definitions of refugees or even possibly of repatriates, given the desire of many to repatriate back to the former colonies. As I conducted research in Rome during the academic year 2010-2011, I spent my days in various archives excavating such stories of former Italian colonial settlers turned refugees and in some instances clandestine migrants. As I emerged from the archives onto the streets of contemporary Rome, I was confronted by the rapidly unfolding events of the Arab Spring, which drove some 52,000 individuals to make the dangerous central Mediterranean passage from North Africa to Italy in 2011 alone. In April of that year, the Italian state declared a humanitarian emergency on the Mediterranean southern shore, working with partners in Tunisia and Libya to detain would-be migrants before they attempted to cross the sea. The irony that some 60 years earlier, Italians from the former colonies had taken similarly desperate routes, both from north to south and south to north across the sea, was not lost on me. But was this a mere historical analog? Or were these stories of displacement after World War II and Italian decolonization historically connected in a meaningful way with contemporary refugee flows? And what, if anything, did the seemingly anomalous or peculiar story of Italian national refugees tell us about the moment of the international refugee regime's coalescence after World War II? The world refugees made reveals the messy processes by which such classifications, repatriates or refugees, national refugees or international refugees were consolidated after 1945. In this, I offer a prehistory of the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees demonstrating how what today may appear a common sense legal distinction between refugees and internally displaced persons, the former eligible for assistance from intergovernmental agencies like UNHCR and the latter the responsibility of their home states, was achieved only through painstaking debates and often ad hoc decision making over how to classify the millions of people displaced by the Second World War and its aftermaths. Questions about the eligibility of Italians displaced from the territories for forms of international refugee assistance came up again and again, not just with UN personnel, but also the Vatican, the British military administrations, the Italian government, and the Intergovernmental Committee on European Migration, among others. Unpacking the Italian case highlights how laborious was the work at the foundational moment of the international refugee system to exclude from the refugee category individuals like those migrating from the former Italian possessions an exclusion rooted, at least in part, in the continuing post-war commitment of many European powers to colonialism. In putting together my study, I heeded the call of legal scholars like James Hathaway to take what he calls historical and real account of the Refugee Convention's context. As a historian, however, I adopt an approach different from that of Hathaway, who examines debates among the Convention's framers alongside what he calls quote, evidence of contemporary factual challenges to the treaty's effectiveness. In contrast, my method is to scale up and down between classifications on paper and in practice, and, their, and to examine their implications in the realm of actual humanitarian relief, 
moving between debates over eligibility within the UN agencies, especially IRO, and on the ground among the displaced themselves, who often challenged the categorizations applied to them as they navigated emerging worlds of relief and rights. Much of the critical analysis of the convention has rightly focused on the Eurocentric nature of its exclusions, that is, its lack of universality exemplified by the temporal and geographic limits put on the refugee definition in Article I until the 1967 protocol. Yet the Italian case underscores just how particularistic this refugee regime was even within a European context, given that the refugee definition enshrined in the convention also excluded many European displaced persons from recognition. Notably, Section E of Article I in the Convention excluded from its remit an individual, quote, recognized by the competent authorities of the country in which he has taken residence as having the rights and obligations which are attached to the possession of the nationality of that country, end quote. So this effectively omitted from consideration national refugees like Italian migrants from the empire and German expellees from Central and Eastern Europe. Article 1D of the convention contained another important exclusion for individuals already receiving assistance from UN agencies, such as the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, which Professor Feldman has studied for many years. Thus, after World War II, a consensus emerged, writes one prominent scholar of international refugee law, quote, that such national refugees were not an international problem and did not require international protection, end quote. Yet achieving this consensus did not prove easy in practice, as the Italian case makes clear, nor was it a foregone conclusion. As international studies scholar Phil Orchard has argued, quote, nothing in historical practice precluded bringing IDPs within the scope of the convention, end quote. Likewise, nothing has precluded scholars from bringing such national refugees into critical discussions of the convention and its historical context, though few have. In those rare exceptions where scholars have, the German case has tended to eclipse the Italian one. One of the few scholars in the early post-war period to acknowledge the significance of national refugees was legal scholar and international lawyer Atle Graal Madsen. While he recognized that national refugees were found in great numbers in countries like Germany, India, Italy, Korea, Pakistan, Turkey, and Vietnam, as he enumerated them, Graal Madsen's discussion focuses almost exclusively on the German expellees. In his work on the origins of internal displacement, Orchard ultimately locates the exclusion of IDPs and national refugees from the convention's definition in US pressure, quote, to frame refugees as having two constitutive properties. They were both outside their own state and lacked its protection, end quote. Like Graal Madsen, Orchard focuses on the issue of German expellees, thereby neglecting the important colonial context central to the Italian story of national refugees. In her book, Asylum After Empire, which I have to admit I found only after I had completed my book manuscript, Lucy Mablin highlights the surprising absence of decolonization histories from many discussions of refugee and asylum law. This reflects, she argues, the presentist bias of refugee studies in general. And I would add that the belated entry of historians into refugee studies left in place a pervasive and historically incorrect periodization that treats refugees as becoming a global concern only in the 1960s and only after the resolution of Europe's refugee question. So this narrative runs something like this. When, contrary to expectations that the resolution of Europe's post-World War II refugee question would end the need for circumscribed instruments of refugee relief, the refugee regime was globalized. As refugee problems were burgeoning in other parts of the globe, new approaches were needed to address them. But this false periodization reinforces what Maybelline elaborates as a myth of difference that sets refugees from the global north apart from those from the global south, many of whom come from former European colonial spaces. In addition, Maybelline contends, the myth of difference thus discredits non-Western asylum seekers through both a blurring and reinforcing of the boundaries between economic migration and forced migration. Just as the Italian case I examined blurs boundaries between histories of post-war Europe's refugee question and the global flows of decolonization, 
Many of the Italian repatriates were dismissed by observers at the time as not being genuine refugees, but rather voluntary or economic migrants, despite them making decisions about migration in a complex situation of intimidation, political pressure, and in some instances, forcible expropriations. Italians weren't the only decolonization refugees excluded from the 1951 convention, obviously, and Maybelin and others have emphasized how the existence of non-European refugees was evident to those constructing and debating the 1951 convention, particularly to the anti-colonial activists who criticized the convention's European definition of the refugee. Maybelin contends that to contextualize properly the convention and place it in relationship to contemporary politics of asylum in the global north, we need to consider two institutional orders, what she calls the colonial and then the transformative or anti-colonial orders, the latter being dedicated to transforming the scope or direction of human rights regimes. Similarly, though from an opposite direction, I would argue that Italians displaced with the loss of empire and those advocating for their, exclusion, their inclusion within the emerging refugee regime represented another sort of transor, transformative order, one critiquing from within the exclusions of what was essentially a European refugee regime rendered normative at the international level. Of course, in contrast to the voices that Mabelin highlights, these Italian critics did not question the colonial order of things. Rather, they questioned the marginality of Italy within the emerging post-war international order. Ironically, it's precisely that marginality that renders the Italian case so productive for re-examining the early post-war refugee order. By focusing on Italian voices and experiences after the war, I've aimed to offer then an alternative critique that further provincializes the regime of international law and assistance developed around the convention. In adopting the language of provincializing, I refer to historian Dipesh Chakrabarti's call to puncture European claims to universality by examining how such ideas, quote, were drawn from very particular intellectual and historical traditions that could not claim any universal validity, end quote. A view from Italy, Europe's margins and site of Europe's first Southern problem offers critical context for understanding persistent exclusions within the international refugee regime that bridge the global North and South. At the same time, Italy continues to live with legal distinctions between citizens and others forged in its post-war encounter with refugees, both foreign and national. The histories that I tell in the world refugees made thus constitute a connective tissue between those of Italian clandestini deported by the British from Libyan shores and non-European clandestini today, aiming their boats for Lampedusa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elena Feldman and Pamela Bellinger for your very insightful presentations. Your talks challenge conventional ideas about the international refugee regime in at least two ways. On the one hand, PAM scrutinizes refugeedom from the margins, reflecting on the legal exclusions produced by this legal framework as a result of persistent failures to recognize the non-European colonial world as a space world of protection. On the other hand, Ilana's account of refugeedom from below demonstrates that Palestinian refugees recognize these limitations and sought to recuperate their rights to humanitarian protection through calls for legal recognition. In these two visions, the international refugee order emerges as an incomplete, contested, but also malleable, and in some cases, a responsive legal framework. Could you elaborate in what ways your two accounts eliminate new aspects of the international refugee order that are conventionally neglected, neglected? And in your opinion, what systems of refugee protection outside of this normative Western framework remain elusive to scholars. First of all, uh, thank all of everybody who's attending um, and thank uh, Arzu, Kabiri, Christian, that's it for bringing us together. And Pam, thank you for your contribution. You know, it's, um, it's a very nice pairing, I think. And this question actually highlights some of the ways in which the things that we're thinking about in different locations, but not necessarily in different times, um, speak to each other. 
And in terms of thinking about the ways in which um, the international refugee order needs to be potentially rethought um, or not just rethought, but how we approach thinking about it needs a reconfiguration based on both of our work. One thing that I would say, and this, I guess, uh, to reference the title of Pam's book, that refugees don't only make the world, they make the humanitarian order. They make the international legal order by no means on their own. And certainly I don't mean to suggest in a naive way that they do so with, with anywhere near the kind of power that um, the states that displace them or the states that receive them or the states that observe these processes have. But I think one thing that's clear from both of our work is that refugees by both active insistence, whether that is insistence on rights or insistence on movement, and also refugees through their very presence and the ways in which their presence can trouble regular state practice or international procedures. Both of those things, the kind of active, and it's the opposite isn't passive, but sort of active engagement and presence, both of those work to shape an international legal order, both because it sometimes needs to respond to the things that refugees are insisting upon or the things that refugees are simply doing, and because it has to kind of take up those things and those people that it doesn't want to acknowledge, right? That question of sort of refusal as part of the building of the system, and this goes directly to the exclusions that, that Pam highlights for us, I think is a really crucial part of the way also that refugee presence um, makes the system. Um, and then I'll just say one other thing and then hand it over to Pam on the question of the sort of systems of refugee protection that might be outside I would say normative frameworks more generally, not just Western ones. One of the things that um, I certainly see in the Palestinian case, and, and not only in that case, that refugees insist that politics is a form of protection. And it's also a form of protection that is, is relevant to humanitarianism um, and to humanitarian orders. Of course, there's all sorts of politics that doesn't have humanitarianism as a reference that doesn't have refugee categories as a reference, right? I'm, I'm not suggesting that, polit that humanitarianism or humanitarian systems have eaten politics, but Palestinians insist that political claims, political recognition, political subjectivity, and political action is also part of a system of protecting refugees as refugees. So I'll, I'll leave it for there for now. Thank you, Ilana. And let me just second Alana um, with the thank you to everyone for the invitation and uh, to Burju for, for your careful reading of our, our work. And um, it's such a pleasure to be part of this conversation. And um, it was wonderful to see the overlaps um, in our work, Alana, that, that you're highlighting. Um, and I would say that uh, many of the people that I was studying um, were demanding just the basic right to be a refugee, right? Um, and that, I don't know if we would see that as preceding humanitarian rights. I mean, it's obviously inextricably bound up with humanitarian rights, um, but um, but certainly, Berger, you, you stress um, or highlight the malleability of um, the refugee framework to some degree. And I think in both cases, we see that obviously exclusions from the formal international refugee regime doesn't mean that forms of protection and humanitarianism uh, don't take place, uh, but they, they take different forms. Um, and uh, we see, I mean, Ilana, in your work, in, in your book, um, you know, very much the way that what you call the politics of living, right? rises up um, to fill those gaps and however uh, incomplete um, or um, you know un, uh, inconstant uh, those forms of protection are. Um, so in the Italian case, those who didn't actually qualify to be counted as international refugees, which were most of them, but who had status as national refugees did receive various kinds of assistance from um, the Italian state. So, I mean, I think there's many of these uh, regimes of, of national relief that have not yet been uh, thoroughly studied um, around the world. Um, 
And so, and in the Italian case, there was uh, relatively little work. There's much more on the German case, for example, the ethnic ex expellees. Um, and one of the things that maybe is worth noting is that people from the former Italian territories who um, were making, they were making all kinds of requests to the UN agencies to be considered eligible, to be considered refugees. Um, and the IRO, the International Refugee Organization, um, did make a number of exceptions where people who had previously been declared ineligible for assistance from IRO were then um, classified as being of undetermined nationality. Um, and this was particularly true in the case of people who came from the Eastern Adriatic lands that, um, uh, from it, that had been under Italian control and were ceded to Yugoslavia. And you got this category um, in the IRO of so-called undetermined Venezia Julians. Um, and these were people who uh, initially had been considered ineligible and then later were given assistance um, to immigrate abroad. But those are the exceptions, I think, that prove the rule. And as you move forward in time to the UNHCR and uh, the Geneva Convention, you see the hardening of, of the category of refugees. Um, so I think that, that some of that flexibility, um, you know, that is part of the kind of ad hoc moment leading to the UNHCR and the convention is lost um, over time. Um, so the second part of your question, and I don't want to occupy too much time, uh, but about, uh, you know, elusive aspects for scholars. I mean, I do think that a persistent exclusion um, are IDPs, both for scholars and policymakers. Obviously, policymakers and scholars have to take account of IDPs because there are so many of them, right? There are many more, even now, many more IDPs globally than refugees. And in 2005, UNHCR um, did take over um, considerable responsibility uh, for IDPs. But I think um, we should heed the words of B.S. Chimney, um, a, a legal scholar who, who reminds us of how frequently scholars conflate legal categories with empirical realities. And he has this wonderful um, phrase that life doesn't imitate legal categories. Um, and so, I think, you know, I would just encourage us all to keep pushing back against the received categories. Um, and, you know, to, that will help us to think about refugees and humanitarianism in, in new ways. Thank you so much. It's, this was a great answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Burtu and Ilana and Pam for both of you on, could you expand on the theme of scale and space uh, in your two accounts? So in your two stories, um, how was refugee status distinguished from statelessness? It appears that the question of who received recognition as being in need of care and protection hinged on the ability or really willingness of nation states to extend that form of security to groups and individual petitioners. At the same time, the international refugee regime espoused universal claims that were to transcend precisely the nation as a legal, fr uh, legal framework of reference. How do you see these tensions between the national and international play out in your two accounts? First of all, thank you to uh, whoever submitted the question. Um, and there's a lot packed in there. So I'm, I'll pick up, I think the question of um, statelessness, the, the association of refugees with statelessness. And in the Italian case um, that I've been studying, um, many of the displaced individuals, whether they ultimately came to be classified as uh, foreign refugees, international refugees, or um, national refugees, certainly in the latter case, were not stateless. Um, and um, with, for example, the IRO, I mean, you see the definition of the refugee under the IRO that then much of it, but not all, is taken up um, by the convention. Um, what's really important is that you've crossed an international border, um, that you have suffered persecution or um, the fear, reasonable fear of persecution. Um, but IRO, for example, was weighing claims uh, of people coming from this region I mentioned, Venezia Giulia. And um, there was a very complicated story by the 1947 peace treaty with Italy for a citizenship option. And if individuals had um, not opted for Italian citizenship and automatically become Yugoslav citizens, 
by the terms of that treaty, but made their way to Italy and made a claim to IRO, they were often considered to be refugees, although they had the they had Yugoslav citizenship, they were not stateless. Um, and in the Italian case, the, the case of the national refugees, um, they they were citizens or they were able to make a claim on citizenship. And in the book I talk about, um, there's a whole series of problematic categories of people who trouble citizenship and who trouble the refugee distinction. So I think what's interesting is that in this pre-1951 moment, refugee is not necessarily synonymous with statelessness. Um, and it's not today either. Um, but I know that that's just one small piece of addressing the tension between the national and the international um, in, in that question. But maybe we can come back to, I'll, I'll turn it over to Alana. And there's also the question of scale and space, um, but I'll stop there for now. I will um, try to not go full on into all of the intricacies of the um, specificity of the Palestinian case, but I think it is um, some of the some of these specificities are, are relevant to your question. So the same way that Pam is talking about the sort of emergence of a definition that is a kind of a precursor to a solidifying, though still in flux. I mean, we have the 51 convention and it's and it's um, you know amendment, but but in practice there's a lot of in, of flux. But Palestinian refugees who are excluded from the convention by Article 1D um, have their own de refugee definition. And in some ways, I think of the Palestinian case, or in many ways, as a kind of um, hinge case in a changing international refugee, interna refugee uh, system. Whereas re the refugee definitions were and are in the case of Palestinians kind of specific to groups and their circumstances and by definition for groups, right? So the there is a definition of a Palestine refugee that describes their situation, right? People who lived in Palestine before 1948 because of the events of the war lost their homes and means of livelihood. So the, there's some interesting distinctions between what are the grounds, the, um, the status grounds, but this describes basically a group condition and a specific condition. And as you move into the 51 convention, even though it is not at first universal, it is universalizing, right? It moves, it begins to move away from this, this a, any specific case begins to, right, take some time to do that, and becomes individualizing. That is, you, an individual needs to show that they qualify. Of course, Palestinians, in, in any and others who had kind of specific and group definitions, still needed to find their individual fit within the category. It's not that that, that goes away, but it's sort of the grounds for thinking about it are a little bit different. Um, and then just the other kind of specific thing in terms of thinking about statelessness for Palestinians, of course, they were prior to 1948 citizens of a non-independent state, right? So Palestine existed, it was a mandate. There was Palestinian citizenship and Palestinian passports and a Palestinian nationality law, all of these things, but there was, but it was not independent, it was, you know. Um, and then with the events of 1948, Palestine disappears. So the, the whole population is rendered initially stateless. So there's a very different kind of dynamic from the, some of what is um, imagined about in the 1951 convention that, that individuals lose the protection of their state, but that state exists out there. And so there's a kind of ongoing question about what is that relationship? Can it be recovered? Is the state that that they have lost the protection of because that state is a is their enemy, right? Is attacking them? Is the source of the, of danger? So there's a slightly different um, set of paradigms. And here it is in the case where the it, the international community through the United Nations has some specific responsibility. Palestinians view it, and the international community in the UN recognize that for their condition of statelessness. So yeah, I, I'm not sure I succeeded in not going deep dive into the specificity of the Palestinian case. All right, thank you so much. I'll try to draw out some commonalities in the kinds of questions we're receiving in the Q&A and sort of reformulate them into 
questions for both of you. Um, and I think here is there's one common thread uh, that I think people are interested in, and it kind of goes to the question of agency and refugeedom. So could you talk about how calls for the right to humanitarian protection have shaped the international refugee system from the vantage point of your two accounts? Um, it appears as though some of these refugee demands treated humanitarian rights as entitlements rather than as statutes yet to be granted in the legal provisions of the Geneva Convention and subsequent legal agreements. Did you, for instance, encounter attempts to, fra to frame humanitarianism as a responsibility rather than a right? Uh, and Ilana, for instance, in your research, have you seen references to the right to development, a collective right that has been conceptualized by third world colonized and dispossessed peoples? Thank you. Um, so let me, let me start with that last and then move my way, the question of the right to development and then back to, through to responsibility and, and protection. Um, and so the question of development is a particularly fraught one in the Palestinian instance. And I think that is partly because it directly connects to a question of settlement. So when um, the UN Relief and Works Agency, we've got two UNRWAs in this, uh, in this conversation, but when UNRWA was established, you know, that, that works component um, was, was a key part of its mandate, uh, kind of faded away over the years, partly because of, of refugee objection, not only that, but partly because of refugee objection to the idea of being resettled without redressing the political claims and, the, and their, the loss and the right to return. So development has always, even though there's plenty of development that is done within the context of UNRWA and other humanitarian organizations that work with Palestinians, but development has a kind of fraught um, context because of the ways in which it, it um, can seem to be a claim for resettlement rather than repatriation. Functionally, but over the years, one of the things that I've certainly that the Palestinian refugees have demanded, and I certainly saw through the course of my research, was increasingly an insistence that that they should have rights to and make demands for multiple kinds of things. So both the right to return and the right to a better life where they live. So, for example, in Lebanon, the right to work. Um, and the right to return. So um, I would say that you know the question of, of development has not you know, taken over this kind of humanitarian rights universe, partly for some of the reasons that I described, but specific, the kind of specific um, demands for opportunity and a better life and better homes that are often built into the way the ways that people talk about development um, are part of people's claim making. And um, you know, I think the boundary between to, to to speak to the other question about responsibility, the boundary between responsibility and rights is a little bit murky here, because in some sense, I think of um, a claim of a right to humanitarianism. So that's the other. You know, I've been talking about right humanitarian rights and rights to humanitarianism, and a claim of rights to humanitarianism is a claim that th that there is responsibility. That people, you know, particularly the international community through UNRWA, have a responsibility to Palestinians to provide them with aid, and also a responsibility to recognize their responsibility to Palestinians, which they see as broader than the question of aid. So it then immediately sort of moves, you know, outside of a simple aid framework to a, a the the question of what constitutes a humanitarian right. Um, and you know, protection is, is clearly one um, aspect of this and has been very fraught in the Palestinian instance, because as I mentioned, protection, which is a key part of the broader global humanitarian you know, regime was not part of UNRWA's mandate. And, and it really was through in part you know, not, never refugees alone, but certainly refugees insisting upon that, that UNRWA would, you know, it's very hard to actually provide those protections, but UNRWA certainly now sees it as part of its responsibility. But that's never enough, right, from, from a Palestinian refugee perspective. And, and again, 
I think refugees in other places similarly would say not enough, right? That to the extent if humanitarian rights is going to be a space for claim making, and I think it is right that it's uh, it, that people are not so much talking about changing international legal instruments, though that might be good too, but more just forcing a recognition in practice of these obligations and responsibilities, and and people seek to move them beyond the the, the things that might be most easily acknowledged or recognized as humanitarian rights. Uh, so. Let me take the question of, I think it was phrased human rights as entitlements, um, or I would maybe use Alana's term of humanitarian rights, um, especially looking at the very early um, moment of when World War II is, um, has yet to conclude and you have the formation of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation um, Administration, UNRWA, uh, which keeping in mind that it was the United Nations and the United Nations originally were the allied nations, so it was not the um, expansive vision of the United Nations that we think of. Um, and here, there was a very fierce debate over um, whether to extend relief to Italy as an ex-enemy nation. Now, Italy was complicated because it had this um, participation of the Southern Italy, Southern Italian government after 1943. But there was very much um, a, a discussion about uh, whether um, to extend this as a kind of entitlement. That's the language that was used. It was not seen as a right. And ultimately there were a series of resolutions that did extend um, first $50 million in the massive um, aid to Italy. Um, and so the question of responsibility, I think comes up with various actors. Um, the British military administrations that governed, temporarily governed the former Italian possessions um, they uh, were often pressed and uh, that they, they had a responsibility to provide humanitarian aid to Italians um, who were seeking to repatriate back or uh, back to the colonies or from the colonies. Um, and they, the British were always trying to balance their own strategic interests and political interests with these humanitarian claims that were being made upon them. Um, and uh, they, they tried to do that in the Libyan case that I talked about by, on the one hand, having a breadwinner scheme that said that anyone who had, was separated from the breadwinner of the family could join that person, and that would be, you know, if, including if they were in Libya. But they also had a head-to-head -head scheme that said that every person who repatriated back to a former Italian colony, another person had to repatriate from in order to keep this balance. So there was this very uneasy calculus of sort of rights and responsibilities, humanitarianism and um, political interest. And I think a similar, uh, you could tell a similar story about the Italian state, um, which had a responsibility to its those who were deemed to be its citizens, and also a particular responsibility in the wake of fascism's defeat and the kind of spectacular defeat uh, uh, collapse of the former empire. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, this is a very specific case, but I think um, you see the, the, that kind of tension, continual tension between rights and responsibilities and, you know, the, the view of this as entitlements. So, thank you. Thanks to both. And Pam's answer is, in fact, a nice segue into our last question. Um, which really speaks directly to the intellectual concerns of our seminar, and that is the question of where the Global South figures in your two accounts. Could you speak to how your research sheds light on the colonial framework of international refugee laws and the resulting post-World War II framework for refugee protection? That is to say, taking your two presentations together, is it accurate to suggest that the framework for refugee protection that emerged after World War II with the 1951 convention was never intended to protect refugees from coming, refugees coming from the global south. And how does that sentiment remain even after the removal of those temporal and geographical limitations from the 1951 convention with the 1967 protocol? I mean, I think um, absolutely that the, the Geneva Convention in 51 was not intended um, to protect, uh, to apply to people coming from what now we call the global south. Um, and I mean, that was what I was sort of um, 
suggesting in my comments is that there's this sort of not in all, but in in some refugee studies literature, this um, kind of odd, um, you know, account that first you had refugees in Europe, and then that was settled, and then you have refugees in the rest of the world, and especially with decolonization. And the Italian case shows how the uh, decolonization and um, European World War II refugee story you know, completely intersect um, geographically and temporally. Uh, and so I think it's a very productive case, um, the Italian case uh, in, in that sense. What also I was trying to sort of hint at, I couldn't really talk about it in full in, in the comments, was that places like Italy um, in this kind of encounter with both foreign refugees and its own uh, decolonizing repatriates, um, ultimately shuts the door on permanent resettlement for foreign refugees. And the Italians again and again say, we have our own, our own refugees to take care of. We can't naturalize um, large amounts of foreigners. We can't be the permanent home. We can only be a point of transit. And um, Italy is one of those countries that signs on to the geographic reservation, which for Italy um, extends beyond the 1967 protocol, which basically accepts the, the geographic limitations um, that you know, they're only gonna take European refugees. And they're not, I mean, it's only really at the end of the Cold War that Italy becomes, uh, you know, starts to become a permanent home. And so I think it's a very interesting case because it highlights um, the, the very um, selective, inclusion of colonial questions for a long period of time in that international refugee regime. Um, and, you know, it's not coincidental, obviously. All right, and I'll just say a few words about how the Palestinian case um, speaks to this. And actually, it's interesting, you know, Pam, you're, you were highlighting the ways in which we kind of have a false narrative that, you know, the refugee, refugee story begins in Europe, moves elsewhere. Um, in kind of in if we look at it through the question of the expansion of this of the refugee convention and where international bodies are going to look. And of course Palestinians trouble that right from the outset because yes, they are not in included in the convention, but they are recognized as an international concern in various troubling ways, right? Not necessarily in the ways that, that they want to be recognized and acknowledged, but they are absolutely taken up as an international concern very quickly. And it's, um, as I said, partly because of the international involvement um, in both what was Palestine, right? So the Palestine mandate was, you know, the sort of late colonial form authorized by the League of Nations. So it was an international, you know, kind of framework. Um, and then the dispossession, dis, disposition of the Palestine problem um, through partition and, and the, um, the creation of the State of Israel and the subsequent uh, dispossession of the Palestinian population were, a, were affirmed by the United Nations. So the problem itself is an international one, which is, there are plenty of other examples of that, but very often we there we there is I think a way of thinking about refugee problems as problems that are elsewhere. There's somebody else's problems, but the international community may be magnanimous enough or have built in a sense of global concern enough to respond to the problem. But the Palestine case, and again there are others, reminds us that very often the problem is an international one. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is that Palestinians have long insisted not just that the international community has this responsibility, has this obligation, but that they are members of this international community, right? So they, that's part of the reason why I think that, that um, there's an objection to seeing this as charity. It's both because of responsibility and it's also because of a claim to participation, which has been brought, you know, very frequently denied or, or ignored or certainly not taken up in the same way. And I think another thing to think about um, in relation to things like these conventions is not just who is recognized by them, right? Which populations are included or excluded from their, their remit and their purview, but how are the solutions to these situations, like what would be, is viewed as an adequate response 
to the circumstances of displacement um, and danger that people find themselves in. Um, and how are that, those um, a com, you know, um, located in, from coming from particular locations? And here again, I'm thinking immediate, for specifically the Palestinian insistence that the, the solution to their problem is, the, is return and national sovereignty, right? Which is not generally view, you know, built into a international refugee regi regime's response to displacement and dispossession. So I think we also have to think about the ways in which the, not just the populations, but the structures of these um, instruments um, are located in you know, time and space. Thank you so much. You have both given us so much to think about and to continue to discuss, hopefully with you and among ourselves. Um, well, with that, we have reached the end of today's webinar, and we would like to thank Professors Alana Feldman and Pamela Ballinger. And we want to thank you for your continued interest, and we invite you to join us for our next webinar on December 3rd in an event which features Jessica White from the University of New South Wales and Emma Meyer from Emory University, who will explore the anti-colonial challenges of international humanitarian law and the management of refugees, building right on this conversation. On behalf of all of the organizers, we wish everyone a good evening. Thank you and good night.